Okay, hi. So uh, thanks very much for uh, coming here to this session. It's really nice to see that there's not enough sitting room. It's fantastic. Uh, I just want to start by addressing Silva's remark about replacing uh, physicians with AI. In radiology, we have a saying from Curtis Langlotz from Stanford saying that it's not that AI will replace radiologists. It's that radiologists that use AI will replace those that don't. Right, so just to be clear, we're collaborating here, right? <laughs> and the, the track here, and thanks Jean-Louis and the organizers for the invitation, is about success stories. And I'll start with success, and then I'll go into the, into the depth a, a little bit. So radiology is one of the most, in a sense, like technology-friendly fields of medicine, right? We have big machines, we have computers, reconstruction. This has been going on for a while. And actually, if you think of it, radiology lends itself quite naturally to kind of an engineering perspective. You can think of the problems that we want to address in radiology in two broad classes. And then we'll dive a little bit uh, down. The first class of problem is that you give me an image, and I give you back an image with some annotations. And the second class of problems is uh, you give me an image and I give you some clinical prediction. I'll show you an example. So this here uh, is an example from detecting an aneurysm. And this is a task that is uh, important for neuroradiologists. Aneurysms are small deviations in, uh, in the arterial circulation of the brain. And you detect it, for example, here with a tough time of flight magnetic resonance and geography. It's very difficult. if you. Show me an image with an aneurysm, I cannot see it. They're really tiny, but for radiologists, it's obvious. The second type of problems we can solve is image to clinical. So this is the, maybe a classical example from a few years ago. You have some kind of weird abnormality on an image, and you want to know, you know whether it's a cyst, an abscess, or something else. Right? So in this case, it's most likely an abscess. Now we can dive a bit more. And this, I think, is what explains why uh, machine learning has been so successful in radiology. Here is a list of tasks that you might want to do if you're a radiologist. So you might want to do a characterization of tissues. You might want to do anomaly or change detection in time if you have longitudinal data. This is a classical task. You might want to do diagnosis or grade the disease. This is also a very uh, common task. Uh, you might want to do differential diagnosis. And I think from this line is where it starts to be a bit more interesting in a sense that the, really the machine learning algorithms start to really help uh, humans a bit more into things that are more dif difficult or subtyping a disease if you have heterogeneous disease. You might also want to do prognosis or progression modeling. This is very important for cancer, for example, uh, but also for slower evolving diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And the last one, which is currently my favorite, is treatment planning. So you have a patient that comes in, let's say with a stroke, should you do you know, mechanical surgery or should you just give uh, some injection? Right? So these tasks are basically most of radiology tasks you can, you can fit in there. On the other side, this is what we know what to do in uh, machine learning. So classification, regression, segmentation, clustering, representation learning, synthesis, I leave out a few. And now the task of the engineer is to say, okay, my radiologist wants to do this, how do I approach? And the point is that it's really not a one-to-one -one mapping. And there's many different solutions in both ways. So for example, to show you one mapping, if you are very good at classification with machine learning, you could do anomaly change detection, you could do diagnosis, you could do subtyping, you can even do treatment planning. Okay? So really this mapping goes both ways and there's not like a single solution for any of these. <clears throat> so you see that basically if you have this mapping in mind, then in a sense, you know, you, you, you know how to deal uh, with radiology as an engineer. And a measure of the success of this is that there has been uh, many, many commercial machine learning products. So this is my definition of success in radiology, is that you have an algorithm that actually makes it through CE marking or FDA approval, right? And you find these two sources if you want to look a bit, if you're curious about what's happening. For example, for fracture, you currently have three, uh, I've heard before, fracture detection. You have like now three algorithms, all from French companies for some reason that are uh, CE marked and that, that you can evaluate, right? So there's about 150 vendors, a lot of small startups, but of, co of course all the big players like GE, Philips, Simmons, etc., etc. And if you look a bit at what's happening, you have a higher uh, adoption of these in commercial practice and in teleradiology. In, in, for some reason, in academic centers, um, it's not so common for these diagnostic tools to be, uh, to be used. And this is what I call foreground machine learning. This is what you think of if you think of machine learning for radiology. But there's also background machine learning. And which is actually super interesting. It's the invisible part. And this is all that concerns acquisition of imaging, reconstruction of this imaging, image enhancement, et cetera. So here you see, for example, this is uh, an open data. You can uh, actually go, this, it's called the fast MRI uh, challenge. Uh, all the data is available. Essentially, the idea is to say, OK, what happens if we 
acquire the data eight times faster. What does happen in terms of image quality? Can we have algorithms that improve? And the answer is yes, up to, up to a point. So you see, for example, on the left, this is the original sampling, the uh, standard reconstruction. On the right, it's eight times under sampling, so eight times fewer points uh, in the Fourier space, and that's the machine learning reconstruction. If you dig a bit, then you see that not all the abnormalities are shown, but nevertheless, this is a really, really interesting data set and an open benchmark. And the thing is that this has very high adoption. I put this in quote because it's not necessarily something that you would be aware of, right? You would actually see these nice images, and then, you know, whether it's done with compressed sensing, this has been going on for years, right? Compressed sensing, you can think of as part of, of statistical learning or machine learning. Um, but this now is being replaced by deep algorithms, and oftentimes it's just rolled out, and you have nice images, and that's it, right? So th there's, um, there's really, really high adoption in this thing. And this ends the success portion of my talk. I'm sorry, Jean-Louis. <laughs> because I think there's many, many obstacles that we have. And it's also good. I mean, if you're doing research, of course, you don't want to say that everything is solved, right? Uh, and so there are, I think, many obstacles to translation. I want to focus on two obstacles that we really need to, to address. And that's, I think, where really the interesting research is. I think computer vision is great, but computer vision, you have you know, ImageNet, you have Lion 5B, you have Common Crawl, you have literally billions of images, etc. We don't have necessarily have that in, uh, in radiology. The other thing that is a big problem for us is heterogeneity. Right? And so what happens is typically this. So you train your algorithm with your nice uh, MR. And this is actually, uh, we did this multi-protocol acquisition. It's the same subject acquired with very different protocols. And you get this nice, this nice kind of accuracy uh, that you that you see here. Not that points. Yeah, not okay. So the blue bar here is okay, very close to 100. Then you do your validation data. Maybe the data is a bit different, and then you move to external data, and then that's when the the, the performance plummets. Right. So this is very very common. It's still a problem. But what I want to emphasize here is this is well known in the field, right? In radiology, I'll show you two examples of uh, some guidelines. So this is the claim checklist. One of the items on this checklist is that actually it, it asks whether it has been validated on external data. So this is not a surprise, right? Nevertheless, if you do this, and this is actually something we're doing at Shirv with actual, uh, for example, this fracture detection software, and we're actually seeing a big drop, right? So some of the algorithms that claim to be very good actually are not as good as an ER physician, for example, right? So this is a big drop. It's not always done. Now you start to have really nice publications in papers that address this. Another one, I mean, just a bit of self-advertising here, the Eclair guidelines that we wrote a while ago. Here we already called exactly for this. So you need this external validation. And one of the things, if you're a physician looking to buy one of these algorithms, you have to check the papers that are published as supporting evidence. Is one of the co-authors from the company that made the software? If so, you have to, I mean, not necessarily that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, not a red flag, but let's say orange, right? So you have to, 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 to take this into account uh, if you do these kind of things. So what do you do with this? You know, what do you do if you want to train your algorithm in one hospital and deploy it to another hospital? I'll show you one solution that we worked on, and then I'll talk about a few other solutions uh, that are possible. So one thing that you can do is, OK, well, um, you know, I like uh, generative AI, so I'm going to train a big GAN, a generative adversarial network. And it works like this. You give me two sites. Let's keep it simple. You give me two sites. I train my algorithm on site one. And before I apply to site two, I transform the data from site two so that it looks like data from site one. Right? So I just brute force force the images to match. Right? I'm not doing anything clever on the algorithm. I'm just transforming my data to close the gap. So this domain adaptation, the, another uh, word for the problem we're facing is domain shift. It's when your data shifts, the distribution shifts. So that's one of the solutions to this. So this is what we did. Uh, this is exactly uh, this is actually an example. Protocol one, protocol two. Protocol one is from Lausanne University Hospital. Protocol two is from Geneva, one of the one of the hospitals there. And we have dementia patients. We want to have very precise quantification of atrophy because that's one of the markers for dementia, right? And so if you just do this without harmonizing protocols, you will see big differences that are just due to the protocols, not due to the patients. Okay, so protocol one, protocol two, you can see the segmentation at the bottom with little arrows uh, as to where you should be looking. So one first very naive thing you could do is called histogram uh, matching. And so you just basically shift the, the distribution of intensities, then you segment your data, and that's what it gives. And if you try to use Argan, uh, you get a bit better. You see that it matches. You see, if you look at the image on the right, the segmentation, you see that it matches a bit better what you have in protocol one, which we try to go towards protocol one. So that's great. Well, that's, that's fantastic. We have better similarity metrics. 
graphics. So of course, you know, now it's great because now we can segment the image automatically, we'll get good performance. But it's not the case. So it doesn't, it's not because you have this high visual similarity. You can even measure it with metrics like SSIM or PSNR. It's not because of this that you will have volumetric consistency, right? So this is kind of a problem still. It's not clear what you should be optimizing for. And this is still something uh, that is being investigated. There's other, other solutions, of course. Uh, you could do transfer learning. So you basically train on one hospital, adapt, you fine tune your model on the other hospital. That tends to solve problems. You could do continual learning. So that we had a question about this before. So it is actually now being rolled out by vendors, even like in, in hospitals. There's also regulation from the FDA on continual learning. So the software as a medical device regulation has a provision now for this continually uh, updating algorithm. So that's interesting. Or you could do domain invariant learning. That means your algorithm is actually very good and it doesn't care where the data comes from. So let's look a little bit at this, just one paper uh, out of many. So here it is a classic uh, segmentation pipeline on the top. And then on the bottom, what these authors did is they basically add a loss term that randomizes the label. So it, gives, it tells you this is hospital one, this is hospital two try to classify the hospitals, but then it randomly shuffles the hospital label so that it learns to not classify hospitals, which means that the features you learn for segmentation will now be independent from the hospital up to a point, right? And this is the result. Just, of course, the algorithm has the top curve. It's the best. Uh, but this is nevertheless a simple idea that tends to work very well, right? So this is one of the other approaches you could do. So that was the first issue. The second issue that you have, apart from the data being uh, all over the place, is that the data is very scarce. I told you before, Lion 5B, common crawl, you know, billions of images. This is not the case in radiology. And I'm very jealous when I see this clinical data set you know, with thousands. I want to have thousands and ten thousands of, of subjects. So what you do is you do acquisition, recognition, uh, reconstruction, sorry, and quality check. This is also time consuming. Then you do some annotations manually. So this could be, you know, painting the voxels, painting the lesions in the liver, painting the lesions in the brain, etc. And then you train your algorithm, right? So if you train your algorithm from scratch, you will need a lot of annotation. The problem with this is first that it's time consuming. So just to give you an example for stroke infarct core. So if you have stroke, you have part of the brains that are severely hypoperfused and that die, these cells are dead. This takes around 20 minutes to a very senior physician, right? For a junior, it would take 45 minutes per brain, right? So this takes a while to do manually. And the second thing is that very high expertise is needed. For example, I told you about aneurysms. I cannot for the life of me find aneurysms on an image, right? The very big ones, yes, but the small ones, I cannot, right? So this, is, this conspires to mean that, okay, we have tons of data, but it's not annotated. So now I want to show you two solutions that we worked on. One is uh, uh, weak labels. And uh, for example, instead of having detailed paintings of lesions, what you could do is you could ask for fast and approximative, uh, approximate annotations. Here on the right, you see this little sphere. So instead of painting the aneurysm precisely, we just ask, OK, let's do a big sphere. And this is much faster. So this, if you do this, it takes around 25 seconds per aneurysm instead of about 100 seconds. So it's way faster, about four times faster to do this. It means you can collect more data. And then you suffer a little bit of heat of performance. You can see here, you drop a little bit, but it's not significant, at least in our test. So this is one solution. Just ask your physicians to do an approximate job, and the algorithm will figure it out. That's good. Second thing you could do is, of course, is also you could leverage these radiology reports that we have, and you could say, well, I want to generate labels that are not very good, you know, but I will generate them automatically. Here, this is an example from glioma progression. So you have these people with brain cancer. You follow them every six months, for example. So this is the image six months ago, and this is the image now. So you see there's some progression, and then you ask uh, some radiologists to tell you whether the change was significant, so progression uh, of the disease or response to treatment. Then you also have a report from this, and from this you could train actually just a very basic, this is super basic NLP we did here, just to train from the text whether there was a change or not. And this means that now you can generate tons of, because you have reports for all of this, right, all this retrospective data. So now you can increase your data set size by threefold, right, and this is, this is very nice for us because this is essentially free labels. This is really what we want, right. And so just to show you, so if you just train on human labels, you get this blue, this blue bar and then you get the green bar. So you get a slight improvement if you do human plus weak, but I'm sure we can scale this, right? So this is just a proof of concept. Okay, I very quickly go over um, other solutions before concluding this talk. You could do also, as usual, transfer learning. You could do semi-supervised learning. So you learn from some labeled data, some unlabeled data. And then you could do self-supervised learning. So you've heard about things like SimClear, et cetera. So this is starting to work really well in medical imaging now. So we, we always have a lag of uh, 
two, four, two, three years on NeurIPS, but now the, the lag is really is really shortening. So this is an example here. I'm just not showing you the technique. If you want to look at the paper, just if you train from scratch, it's the blue bar. Uh, if you use the SimClear technique, the one from I think Meta or Facebook AI, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's the green one. And if you do th this technique here with contrastive learning and some clustering, you get the gray bar. Oh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry for that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is the bar. Voila. Okay. So thank you for for telling me. Voila. So this is something that is basically it's it's it's, it's coming and it's there and we basically we should all use it because it saves a lot of time. So to conclude. Success stories, uh, as you can see, there's many radiology tasks that map to machine learning tasks. A lot of commercial success for background uh, ML, but depends uh, on the adoption. Uh, the foreground ML is a bit more uh, lagging, I think, in terms of academic radiology. Challenges, data heterogeneity, big problem. I showed you domain adaptation, for example, or domain invariant learning. Second challenge, data scarcity, and then uh, probably weak supervision and self-supervised learning are good solutions. So thank you very much, and thank you uh, to my team for the work. <laughs>